Welcome. This time on Woodworks, we'll show you how to build this beautiful side table made out of solid mahogany. Hi, I'm David Marks. Welcome to Woodworks. This Chippendale inspired side table features a book match panel on the top. It's made from solid figured mahogany. The legs on this table have simple classic lines and the dark wenge accents had an Asian touch. The match grain on the top panel moves in sort of a butterfly pattern with the two halves appearing as if we've opened the pages of a book. Choosing the wood for any furniture project can be a lot of fun. We chose Honduras mahogany for this side table because it's got everything that you're looking for in a lasting relationship. It's beautiful, it's strong, and it's easy to work with. For the book match panel, we chose this particular piece of wood. See that shimmering quality on the grain of the wood? That's what jewelers call chatoyance. We've got our fence set at 3 eighths of an inch, and now we're ready to resaw our panel stock in half. Now here's some helpful advice for you. By putting a little piece of blue tape on this ruler, makes it easier to see these small lines. We've already jointed our stock flat, and that's important because you need a flat surface to reference up against the fence. So we'll put our safety glasses on. Now we're ready to resaw our panel in half. Next, we take the sections and joint the edges to make flat surfaces for our glue up. Here's the two halves of our book match panel that we've just jointed. Now I'll take a piece of chalk and put a big chalk mark on the center line. And that way, once we put the glue on, we're starting to feel a little anxious. We don't get confused and set it the wrong way. So now we'll do a dry fit just to make sure that our joint is going together the way we want it to. Once we've got this lined up right, we're feeling good about it, then we can put the glue on. We use a waterproof yellow glue. That way we get an invisible glue joint that won't swell from moisture. On a panel of this size, we use three clamps to provide pressure on both ends, as well as the middle. While the glue is drying on our panel, we can start making the joinery that connects our legs to our aprons. Now we're going to be using a loose mortise and tenon construction. And you can see by this example that what we'll be doing is cutting a mortise into our leg and a mortise into our apron, milling up a loose tenon that connects the two. To make the mortises in our legs and aprons, we use a two-flute carbide bit here at the router table. It's a fast, accurate way to cut a mortise. We've also installed some stop blocks to control the length of the mortise on the front and back of the fence. On our leg stock, we've made some pencil marks on the two sides where we'll be making our mortises. That way, when we cut the mortises, we won't confuse things when we go to rotate the stock. To reduce stress on the bit, it's best to cut the mortises in incremental steps, about a quarter of an inch at a time. After cutting the mortises on our legs, we reset the stop blocks and mortise the ends of our aprons. Now we've got a nicely milled mortise. Next, we're going to mill up some loose tenons like this one. And what we're after is what we call a friction fit. We don't want the tenon to go into the mortise so tight that you have to pound it in there with a hammer, but you don't want it in there so loose that it's going to fall out when you turn it upside down. To make the tenon, the first step is to rip the stock to width on the table saw. On the band saw, we'll rip it to thickness and leave it oversized a 32nd of an inch. Then on the planer, 
We'll mill it down to its final dimension and check it with the calipers. In order for the tenon stock to fit the mortises, we round the edges with an eighth inch radius bit at the router table. When the long stock fits our mortise, we cut the tenons to size on the table saw. With our loose tenons milled up, now we can check the fit of our joinery. So we'll put that into our leg, and into our apron, and there. That's what we're after, is a good snug fit. So with the joinery process out of the way, now we can start the shaping process. It's the shape of the legs that gives our table its classic style. Now you can see from this example that it's a combination of cuts that adds up to give our legs that elegant feel. Now to achieve those cuts, we're going to do that right here at the router table using a combination of these four router bits. To start, we use this V-bit to create a really nice shadow line on the outside of the leg. Then we'll come back with a core box bit to create two cove shapes down the center of the leg. After that, we'll come back with a 3 16 of an inch radius bit and create this nice rounded edge on the three outside corners. And then we'll finish up by using this chamfering bit to create a very elegant bevel on the back side of the leg. But before we begin shaping our legs, we'll start by clamping these fingerboards into place. Now these fingerboards are great. You can either buy them at a woodworking store, or you know what, they're easy enough to make yourself. But what's great about these is when you have these clamped into place, they really keep your hands from wearing out by holding the stock firmly up against the fence and the bit and ensuring very accurate cuts. It's the combination of passes that gives our legs a classic shape. The V-bit cuts the lines that define the edges of the leg. Two concave cuts are added to each of the outside faces with a core box bit. And the radius bit softens the outside edges adjacent to the V-cuts. Only one pass with a bevel bit is needed on the inside corner. Next, we'll shape our aprons. First, we use a V-bit to cut a parallel line along the bottom of the stock. Then, we make a second pass with a quarter inch radius bit to round off the edge, creating a nice bead. We finished shaping our aprons and they came out really nice. And so did our legs. Now we'll take some 220 grit sandpaper and do a little bit of sanding to sort of soften this edge, give our piece that handcrafted look, and then we're ready to glue up the base for our table. After dry fitting the parts together to check the alignment, we can glue up our base. We start by putting glue in the mortise, then the tenons. Once we've got it all assembled, we install a band clamp and some corner blocks to hold it in place. When it's tight, we check with a square to make sure we've got right angles in all the corners, then set the base aside for a couple of hours to let the glue dry. As we said earlier, the centerpiece for our side table is this book match panel. Now to set that off properly, we're going to be making a frame using some straight grain mahogany. That way the straight grain of the frame won't be competing with the figure grain of the panel. And it will complement it much the way a picture frame does for a painting. Now we'll start with some mahogany that we've already milled up, nice straight grain. We'll begin by cutting a dado in the side to accept the panel. Two passes on the table saw will give us a quarter inch dado, wide enough to accept our panel. On the router table, we use an OG bit to shape the inside edge of the frame. Then, we cut a 45 degree miter on the ends of our frame stock with the chop saw. We're using a biscuit joiner to mill some slots into the miters of our frame. 
Now doing biscuit joinery is very similar to doing a mortise in a loose tenon joint. But it's almost like someone's already made up the loose tenons for you. Now in this case, we're using a number 20 biscuit. So now we'll unclamp this and finish milling up the slots in the rest of our frame. We're just finishing up removing the glue from the center line of our panel. Now that we've got that out of the way, we'll come back with this. Now this is a handheld scraper. This is a great little invention. The simple piece of steel removes a lot of material quickly, much like a hand plane, but without the risk of chipping out. Now by using the scraper and just holding it at a slight angle like this, making some smooth strokes with the direction of the grain, we can really remove these mill marks rapidly and bring out the clarity and the figure of the wood. Next, we cut our panel to size on the table saw. Then, we add a rabbit around the bottom of the panel by using a square tip ripping blade. This blade will make sure the rabbit is a clean 90 degree surface. We've got the rabbit cut in the bottom of our book match panel. Now we're ready to fit it into our frame. We're just finishing up using the fit of our panel to our frame. I've been using a block plane and a scraper to just sort of chamfer this edge a little bit, make sure that it goes easily into our frame. Now we're ready to do our glue up. Now what's important here is that we don't want to put any glue on the rabbit or on the dado. If we do that, it could possibly restrict the movement of the wood and cause our panel to crack. So what we do want to do is just put some glue on the biscuit and on the miters. A band clamp works great to hold the frame together. And here's a good tip. Adding four bar clamps positioned on the corners will really pull the miter joints in nice and tight. The glue is dried on our frame and panel for the top. Now we're ready to shape the outside edge of the frame. And you're probably wondering why we didn't shape this edge earlier. Well, the reason is we want to leave some square corners on the edge of our frame so we have something for our clamp to hold on to. And that way we could pull our miters in nice and tight. Now if we had shaped this edge earlier, our clamp might have possibly slipped off of here and damaged the edge. So, we've got a Roman OG bit set up in place and now we can flip our top over and begin shaping the frame. The OG bit adds some nice detail along the top of our frame. To lessen the chance of chip out, we make two passes, raising the bit to full height for the second pass. Next, we use a 3 8 inch radius bit to round off the bottom of the frame. Again, we raise the bit incrementally, making two passes. That radius bit did a good job of softening the bottom edge of our frame. It gives it sort of an upward feel to it. Now to finish this off, we're going to need to do some sanding. Now here's a tip. If you take some sandpaper and double stick tape it to a dowel, it's a good way to get inside and clean up this concave surface. So after we finish sanding this, we'll be ready to glue the top of our table to the base. We put glue only on the base, not the top. That way we can minimize squeeze out. We set the top in place. Some blue tape will help to get the alignment right. And here's a tip about clamping. Blocks of wood with a thin layer of cork attached allow us to get good clamping pressure without damaging the wood. Now a long grain to long grain glue up is all you need for attaching the top to the base. You don't need any other fasteners. 
So by gluing the frame to the apron, that's all you need for a good strong bond. Now I'll give the glue a couple of hours to dry. Now we're ready to add a final accent. The glue is dried on our side table, and now we're getting ready to make these accents. Now these accents will go between our legs and our apron, and we're gonna make these out of an African hardwood called wingi. Now wingi is kind of an expensive wood. It costs about $14 a board foot. But the good news is that it's only gonna take about a few dollars worth of wingi, and that few dollars will add a tremendous amount of value to our side table. Now we're gonna need to make about eight of these to go around our legs, so we're gonna use a technique called batch cutting. Here's a stack of four pieces of wingi that we double stick tape together, and then we cut the exterior shape on the scroll saw. The green tape on the top of the stack makes it easier to see the layout lines, which were traced with a pencil from this template that we made. Next, we drill a pilot hole in our stack. After threading the blade through the pilot hole, we use the scroll saw to cut out the interior triangles. Wingé is a very hard wood, so it's important not to rush because you might break the blade. Next, we round over the outside edges on the router table using an eighth inch radius bit. Then, we use a very fine Italian riffler file to round over the inside edges of our accents. We've just put our last wingy accent in place using some five minute epoxy. And now that that's done, we'll just give our table a final inspection and then we're ready to put the finish on. We use a red mahogany oil stain, which really brings out the depth of the wood. It accentuates the grain patterns and amplifies the three dimensional quality of the wood. With a few finished coats of tongue oil, our mahogany side table shows off in excellent fashion. The book match panel flows with ribbons of light and dark grain, and the frame provides an elegant border. The wenge accents lend a delicate Asian touch, and the legs complement the overall classic style of this beautiful table. As far as maintaining your side table, Here's a couple of different options. Try an occasional light dusting with a few drops of lemon oil, or use a little bit of a high quality wax on a soft cloth. I'm David Marks, thanks for joining us.